love that verse. Um, all right. So the national airspace, right? So the FAA is responsible for anything that goes up into the air. Right? So it's, and then they refer to it as the national airspace or the, the NAS or NAS, right? There's so many freaking acron acronyms <laughs> in aviation, so just make an acronym up. But the NAS, right? So a lot of, a lot of words here, <laughs> just letting you guys know. Um, but this right here is just the, the definition saying that FAA rules the sky, right? Congress said FAA, Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation Administration, you are responsible for regulating anything that goes up in the air. You gotta remember they did this way back, right? 40s, 30s, 40s, right? When it was just manned air, the drones weren't a, a, a real thing at that point. Right, like a consumer drone. So, um, so it's all it's all about manned aircraft. Like their structure is all about manned aircraft. And the FAA swears up and down. They say this all the time. They're not a regulatory agency. They're a safety agency. <laughs> so, so take from that what you will. They are. They regulate, right? But they say no, no. They're a safety agency. We, and and ideally, all the regulations revolve around. Safety, right? Safety for manned aircraft. They don't. I. They. They don't care about us. <laughs> they. They care about manned aircraft, and rightly so, right? So, anyways, this is the statute that says that the United States government has the exclusive sovereignty over airspace of the United States, pursuant to four one of three. Um, the airspace, therefore, is not subject to private ownership nor can the flight of an aircraft within the navigable airspace of the United States um, constitute a trespass. So that gets the whole thing, well, you're flying over my house. Yeah, I am, but as long as you're not hanging out over somebody's house, then, then, then that's harassment, right? That gets into invasion of privacy and those kind of things. But if you're flying over, right? So um, unmanned aircraft or aircraft can, right? Consistent with the so B the public law and business specification that it includes drones, right? And then down here, this is just saying that they they were given the authority to regulate the areas of airspace, airspace use, management and efficiency, air traffic control, safety, navigable uh, uh, facilities, and aircraft noise at its source, meaning from the aircraft, right? They're responsible. So with that. Like I said, they came up with these airspace classifications, regulations, guidelines, rules, all centered around manned aircraft. And then drones. And they said, crap, what do we do? Where do we put these? Where, what are these guys doing? How do we keep manned aircraft safe? These guys are getting, these guys are now legit. Where are we gonna move them? So they said, okay, well you, drone pilots, need to adhere to this. Right, adhere to our laws. We already we've been doing this for decades, so you just conform to what we're doing. Right? So again, all the airspace classifications and everything kind of revolves around manned aircraft and the world of airports. Alright. So another thing, so as we get into terminology, we're gonna talk about measurements. Right? And I'll put this up on Canvas too, by the way. So um, I actually thought I did, but I tweaked it last night, so I'll put it up today. Um, so there's two types of measurements. When we talk about aviation, actually there's other measurements, but really this is as far as altitude go. There's MSL and AGL. These are ones that are in reference to your 107 as well. Okay? So you have to kind of understand this. MSL, well, let's, let's go with AGL, above ground level. Right, pretty much the FAA defer like us, drone pilots, AGL. Like they, they know our world is pretty much AGL. Above ground level, so it's right from the ground up. What you see is what you get, right? 400 feet is 400 feet. MSL is 
made primarily for instrumentation and for manned aircraft to kind of get that that mean sea level one so they're not doing this up and down as they fly across the country, right? So it kind of averages it out and says, this is it. But for us, there are some instances where we'll run into MSL, but for the most part, we live in AGL. And the FAA is fine with that. They just don't overthink it. 400 feet is 400 feet. Is that MSL? No, no, 400 feet is 400 feet. Our controllers, everything, <laughs> what you see is what you get, right? So, right, above ground level or mean sea level, right? You'll see more AGL, we'll talk in terms of AGL, but there will be some airspace classifications that are defined under MSL. So they're higher up, right? Okay, so ready for the classifications. You will need to get familiar with this chart and understanding this chart. This chart kind of gives the concept of airspace classification. Okay. So, the FAA, like I said, they're, they're around manned aircraft, right? So, um, what, what is one unifying thing about manned aircraft? What do all manned aircraft have to connect with? Airport. Right? We, we can take off and land anywhere, but they, they have to go off of airport. So the FAA, when they set up airspace, set it up with airports. Everything's centered around airport. So with that, there's two types of airspace. There's controlled and uncontrolled. Okay. Not restricted or anything like that. There is restricted airspace, but that's a whole other deal. Controlled or uncontrolled. Well, I can't fly them, that's restricted. Well, if you're like at Point Magoo, maybe, you know, then, but, but if you're by the airport, then it's controlled. It's controlled or uncontrolled, okay? So, these are different classifications. It's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and go. There's no F. Right? Nobody fails. <laughs> so there's no F. Um, so the different classifications. First off, let's make this easy. See way up there at the top? Class A, that's alpha. Don't worry about it. Just know it exists. So that is like cruising altitude in transcontinental flights. The FAA just wants you to see it like, oh, yep, yeah, there it is, and never go there. Right. There's no reason that any drone should be in that airspace. Right? I mean that's that's listed in MSL, but you can already see those that's a pretty big digit. So that's pretty high, right? So don't even worry about that. Um so A is gone. Everything that we look at is what touches the ground, right? What what's closest to us. And how high can we go? Right? So it's like us to 400 feet is really the world that we're, we're looking at. Right? So a lot of this other stuff is like, oh, wow, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to us. And you'll see how that will be more calming when you look at sectional charts. But so that kind of a thing is that we look at what touches the ground. So Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Golf, sometimes Echo, right? We can push up into Echo sometimes, okay? That's all, right? That's what we're worried about, okay? With the classifications, so I guess some explanation too. So let's just look at class A, because it's right there at the top, everybody can see it. It's got two numbers, 18,000 and 60,000. Airspace is defined by Ceiling and floor. Right? So we're within the ceiling and floor, we're in that airspace. We go above the ceiling, we're in something else. We go below the ceiling, we're in something else. Over underground. Right? So that's where that's what the two numbers represent. 
So lower number obviously is the floor, higher number is the ceiling. Okay. So again, class A, their floor is 18,000 MSL. Don't even worry about it. You'll see with the 107 that there's a lot of stuff, right? A lot of information that's accessible, but it's not for us. It's for manned aircraft, manned pilots. We just need to worry about what affects us. And again, when we get to the sectional charts, you'll see why that's that's more comforting because there's a lot of information on there you can get lost in. So, all right. So we'll go to Bravo, Class B. So Class B and Class C are usually defined as a upside down wedding cake, right? Two different layers. And that's because planes take off and land, right? Airspace changes where the planes are coming in, right? So again, up there, we don't care. What's down here? What's, what's where we are, right? So usually with class B, let's go with class, class B, class C. If they're centered around the airport. By the way, airports, um, it's not necessarily like the airport itself, because there's like an airport manager and stuff like that, and they're nice people, but that's not who we talk to. We talk to air traffic control, the tower, right? It's the tower. And air traffic controllers are FAA employees, right? So they're federal employees, FAA. They sometimes don't even talk to the airport manager. They just got their business, they're managing the, the traffic, right? So we have to go by what they say. They're managing the traffic. So the closer you are to an airport, the more controlled the airspace is. Any airport, usually. I mean, unless it's like a little airstrip or something like that, then FAA really doesn't care about it. Um, there may be some control kind of a thing we'll talk about, like it could be like an E, but it's higher up and you're still good on the ground and we'll talk about that. But usually if it's, if it's an airport, there's, there's a, the FAA looks at it as like controlled in some capacity. Okay? So class B is busy airports, right? Like really busy airports, LAX, SFO, Chicago O'Hare, right? These are bigger airports that have a lot of traffic. Therefore, they're Class B. They're, there's a lot of planes coming in and out of there. So they, basically the FAA says, okay, we have to manage that traffic, so we're gonna make it a little bit more controlled with Class B. So usually it's like a five mile radius around the airport, almost circumference. Not always, but sometimes. Right, five miles, five mile radius around. And so that's where class B touches the ground. I'll show you how to confirm that on the charts. But anything within here, we need authorization from the tower to fly. We just need their permission. They wanna know how high we, we're gonna be, how long we're gonna be up, where we're located, those kind of things, and then they can determine, yeah, you're okay, or no, right? Or they could ignore you. And then that's enough. But um, but if you're outside of here, you're uncontrolled and it's okay. okay. That's class G. I'll talk about class G. Next week. But all right, so class B, busy airports. Class C, more moderate airports. Um, a lot of other airports are class C, um, like fairly busy ones. And again, five miles. By the way. This says five nautical miles. Don't rack your brain. Don't be like, okay, nautical versus statute or, you know, kind of a thing where it's pretty much the FAA's, if five miles is five miles, right? But I mean, if they actually took a measurement and it's like exact, this is gonna be longer, but, but roughly, right? So like on the test purposes, they're not gonna ask you the difference between nautical and statute. Right? What are they using nautical for the- Wow, I everything. I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. So, um, I don't know. It's funny, I was going for a, um, a proposal with the FAA a few years back, and they were like, okay, give us the, 
give us the range of your project in nautical miles. I'm like, nautical? The Navy? What are you talking about? Why are we in nautical miles? So that's just, anyway. So getting the KML file and doing nautical miles. And, and so, um, so, yeah. But again, they're not going to ask you the difference. Five miles is five miles. They're going to say, like, is it five miles? And you, and you don't have to hit back and say, like, well, nautical or statute? They just, five miles is five miles. At least on the one I'm right? So class C, same thing, upside down wedding cake, takeoff and landing. So you're usually in this five mile radius, right? From the airport. And then from there, you need authorization. Outside of that, you don't. One thing I do want to show you visually here, and you'll see it when we start looking at the maps, is these layers. So you'll see it, because you'll have to be able to interpret maps, and I'll show you in a second. You're looking at a 2D flat picture, right? And it's giving you visual lines from a top-down perspective. You're looking down. So sometimes on the map, you'd be like, oh, class C, I need authorization. It's like, no, because you're actually here. This would represent G. It's underneath this shelf. Again, the FAA wants you, wants us to look at where we are in our world. So we'll have to. Look, you'll see. You'll have to look through things. So that's why I want to show you the visual representation. Sometimes, class C, class B, will extend, but it's a higher shelf. It's not a, not our concern. We don't even have to worry about. It. We just have to know it's there and don't fly up there. But for us, we're, we're good to go underneath. Okay? We'll see as we take off. But I just want to show you that, so hold on to that. Um, class D, Delta, smaller airports, mostly general aviation airports. A lot of these ones, right, are probably class, D. I didn't, I looked at the one briefly. Um, class D, so, D is, there's no wedding cake involved. D is always surface. D always touches the ground. They just tell you how high it goes up. And, and it doesn't have to be in a circle. It can be in a rectangle. It can be in a parallelogram. It can be however, I've seen some weird ones. We have a weird rectangle shaped one down there in Florida City. Right, but it's rectangle but with a slant. So, right? So class D, not as busy as LAX, but still control, right? Outside of that, this yellow area is class G. Class G is uncontrolled airspace. Class G is no authorization needed. Class G is, is, G is go, right? G is good to go. So you go in class G airspace, you, you, I mean, you, you look for that, right? It's like, oh, cool, I don't have to bug anybody, I don't have to request anything, good to go. Line of sight, 400 feet, still apply, but you don't have to have the tower permission. Yeah. So Santa Paula Airport doesn't have a tower, but it is still like a pretty active airport. Would that be class D? Because I know the only thing they like communicate on is like the radios between each other when they're like up. So how would you even communicate with the pilot? We don't communicate. So okay. the we'll we'll go deeper into that. I'll answer that, but we'll go deeper into that when we get to airport operations. So there are towered and non-towered airports. Right? They can still be controlled. If the airspace is the airspace, the FAA puts it out there because of traffic. Right? But it's just if it's not towered, then there's different ways that we have to request things, right? Usually through the website and that kind of stuff, which is a little bit, you have to plan out a little bit longer if you know you're going to an area that has a non-towered airport nearby that has controlled airspace to get permission from the FAA. So it it's planning. Um, but yeah, but you bring up a, a good point. <laughs> the FAA did not want us talking to pilots. They really don't want it now, they don't want us talking to the tower. 
Back in the day, we used to call, I, I used to have to call the tower and stuff, right? Now they're like, yeah, you know, there's too many of you, we're too busy. Send us an email, send us a Lance request, and we'll just figure it out from there. Get, we'll get into that stuff. So the only thing though, and we'll talk about this when we get into airport operations, with class B, they really want us, they would prefer that we monitor radio traffic, like tower radio communication. I don't know if you've listened to air traffic communications, but you know, after you wake back up, <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually kind of interesting, but they are talking a different language. And the FAA doesn't really expect, they want us, they, they hope we can know what the pilots are talking about, but, and what the air traffic's talking about, at least have an idea, but they don't, they don't really require us to be able to translate or anything like that. So, but they do want us to monitor basically, basically because if they start routing traffic in different locations, something's happening at the airport, they're moving around, they just want, and it's a busy airport, and we're flying here, and they start sending traffic this way to circle around or something, they just want us to be aware that something's happening, right? Or emergencies are happening. They don't necessarily care about C or D airports, but B airports they do because, because of the volume. Okay. Um, but like I said, class G, you're good to go. In between, there's this class E thing. And class, I, I actually went to a whole workshop by the FAA on class E. I actually have a, I, I stole their PowerPoint, which is really helpful, um, about class E airspace. Um, because it's so, it's so hard to wrap your head around. You never, you, you, it's not like you're never in it, but you're rarely in it, but sometimes you are. Um, class E is just this like marshmallow filling in between. Like it just squeezes in between different things. And then there's some that have a floor of 1,800 feet. Some E has a floor of 700 feet. That's the one that we have to kind of pay attention to because if we go over a structure, that's like a 300 foot structure or a peak or something like that, four plus three, 400 plus 300, 700, and we're touching and controlled airspace. We would need authorization, right? Even though we're not gonna fly, the FAA looks at it, it's like a drone's going over, drone needs to calculate max altitude to have that 400, even though we're only gonna probably fly at 200 feet above it, they want us to get authorization. Right? Um, and then there is a surface E thing sometimes, but if you see that, I'm like, oh, that's surface E. We're okay with those. That's, that's technically, we don't have to get permission for surface E. Um, Usually, like if it's a surface E bump out, unless if it's a surface E, if it's an airport that we well, will see, if it's an airport that's covered by surface E, we need authorization. So, I know, like I said, I'm speaking words that you're like, what? They'll see. So, anyway, on this and in your chapter, there's the breakdown of what I just said, right? Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and Golf, right? A little bit more specific. You can see some of these ones do calculate in MSL, but they also have AGL interpretation, right? right. All right, the reason being is because the FAA wants us to be able to read and interpret these. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's a whole different language, right? Some of you guys are, some guys are like, what? <laughs> that. Right, this is Los Angeles. This is Southern California, right? So, um, right, there's John Wayne Airport, there's LAX. Um, so it's just really busy. I could have brought SFO. I said the Bay Area's got some crazy stuff. San Diego has some really crazy airspace because they've got a lot of restricted stuff down there. But, um, anyways, the great thing about this, right? I mean, it's probably, you guys are probably getting anxiety, like, I have to read, I don't know, there's a lot of lines, and a large portion of this is not us. It doesn't pertain to us. That's what I was telling you. 
The FAA just wants us to determine and worry about what, what matters to us. Some of these lines and stuff, not our thing, or we just need to acknowledge, oh, yep, yeah, that's that, right? Uh, um, briefly, just to kind of show you, these little things are airports, right? These little blue kind of things. Um, I'll show you, just because it's in arm's reach. This is John Wayne Airport down in Santa Ana. This magenta circle, this hard line circle, magenta, hard line circles, or magenta color lines, hard lines, class, that's class C. Right? So with this magenta circle, this is that top layer of the wedding cake. This is that radius around the airport that I was talking about, right? So what this does, when you see hard lines, like solid lines, you'll see blue solid lines up there. Blue solid lines and magenta solid lines, we have to pay attention to. That's airspace classification. So when we see those, we know there's an airport in the area, we find the airport, Here's the airport information. We'll get to that later. But that's how you can tell there's the airport. But then we look for the lines. This hard line circle, cool. If it is a hard line, it'll have, some, it'll have a fraction. And you look for that fraction, right? So it's a 44 over SFC, right? So I was, I was almost that in the army, so SSG. Anyway, um, the, uh, I know some of you guys are prior service. Um, you get that. So this right here, you look, you look for the fraction, because there's fractions, right, all in these little, little icons. What the fraction shows you is ceiling and floor of that area. That area, that area, that area, that area, that, right? So, ceiling and floor, 44. You multiply that by 100. Just add two zero. So it's 4,400 feet. Your ceiling of this tier of that wedding cake is 4,400 feet. The floor, when it's SFC, that's surface. That's all work, right? So anything around here anything within this circle, we would need authorization from the tower at John Wayne, Orange County Airport. That's it, automatic, right? If you're out here, you're like, oh, there's class C out here. It is, but this is why I was talking about that top down view, looking at a 2D thing, but thinking in 3D. So you come out here, 54 over 15. Right, 5,400 ceiling, 1,500 floor. How high can we fly? And that's 1,400. Then you start looking like, well, what's underneath that, right? What's underneath that cake? So that, that shelf is above, so I don't have to worry about that. Next, what's next? Right, you start peeling things down. So, like I said, a knee-jerk reaction will sometimes look at this and be like, oh, cross C. Okay, moving on to the next question. Like, no, no, not where you are. If you're here, yes, but if you're out there, tell no. um, What you would do then, there's other things in here. These, this little gradient magenta line is a class E thing. And I'll show you that in a second. But then you would look at the class E, and that class E says it's 700 feet still above. The floor class E magenta gradient is 700. So that's above where we are, 400 feet. So basically, anything out here, good to go. We don't need authorization. There might be a plane flying over here. Especially Orange County, they do a weird thing down there. I don't know if you guys have ever flown in, uh, flown out of John Wayne. They do noise abatement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's kind of right next to the yeah, that noise abatement thing though, when you take off from John Wayne, not a fan. I'll go to Ontario, I'll go to LAX. Because what they do is they basically, they, they, you're on the plane, and you're sitting there, and the pilot just 
revs the engine and just pops his foot off the clutch and just, <laughs> right? So you go up high and then you level off and then they cut back the engine. And then you just kind of coast. <laughs> Basically because the homeowners along the coast didn't like the noise. So when they take off, then they have to cut back the engine so there's less engine noise until they get out over the water and then they pick it back up. So you're like up like a rocket ship and then things go really, really calm, like weirdly calm on an airplane and then picks up again. No, I'll take on terror. I'll, right, I'll drive out to LA, LAX, I don't care. Um, so I'll go down to San Diego rather than, um, anyways, <laughs> just cause, um, so if you ever go there, if you land, it's fine, but taking off, just, just so you know, take grandma. Um, so blue LAX, busy airport, the blue lines, class B, just like class C, you look for the fractions. So right here around LAX, it's 10,000, like 100 at two zero, that's 10,000 ceiling to surface. So because it's LAX, because it's a really busy airport. So anything around this area is controlled and you have to have authorization from the tower. Right? There's little, the class D's, I'll show you class D's real quick. And then I'll, I'll, it breaks out, I'll show close up ones. But uh, let's see, I'll even show this area. Right here, there's Los Alamitos. Class D are these little dotted blue lines, right? You just kind of follow it around and see how it, how it connects around the airport. Okay? So when you see it, when you see dotted blue lines, you know, like class D, I gotta, gotta see where that is and see where I'm flying, where does it control it? Then remember class D is always surface. The floor is always surface, so it always touches the ground. So it, you get these little, bracket numbers, that's the ceiling times 100. 2,500 ceiling to surface in this little dotted area, right? That's class D, right? <laughs> There's a lot of other little things on here that, um, that we'll have to kind of pay attention to and certain things we'll talk about later on and it'll, it'll pop up, um, but it is, you know, it can be anxiety inducing. Not all sectional charts are this busy, just so you guys know, especially if you go in other states and rural areas, it gets a little more sparse. So it's not all chaotic like this. I, I picked this one in particular. But you usually have this, which is great, because you're like, I don't, I don't remember, is blue, magenta, blue, da, da, da. here it is. This column right here, up at the top shows you the airspace classification. The solid blue line right next to it says class, class B airspace. Magenta solid line, class C. Dotted blue line, class D. So it, it's there. Even on your 107, this is available. You just flip to the book. And... So, right, when it gets to, I got a laser pointer, but when it gets to the underneath where it says 40, and then the next, the next three refer to class E. Right. These ones over here show you the different types of airports. Again, we'll get to that later. And then this over here, we'll get to this later. This is like the radio frequency for the control tower and where you get emergency information and you can even get altitude of the airport and stuff like that. So we'll get to that later. This right here, the miscellaneous, these are kind of cool. And you see these on the map, they're like, oh my gosh, parachutes, you can still fly. It's just saying heads up, right? There's people jumping out of planes, don't hit them, right? So same as gliders, um, ultralights, hang gliders. It's just letting you know there's other things in that area, right? So, and just be on, on the lookout. Doesn't prohibit you. It just says, be on the lookout. Right, you guys getting this? Does it make sense? Okay. 
Let's go a little closer. Let's go to Santa Barbara. All right, Santa Barbara's cool because it's simple. It's less anxiety inducing like <laughs> I just showed you before. So this is the close of Santa Barbara, all right? So Santa Barbara Airport is right here. This indicates the classification. What, don't overthink this one. What airspace classification in Santa Barbara? <laughs> like I said, don't overthink this one. Does he want us to say C? Yeah. Right? So the magenta is C, right? So it's not a B, it's not a D, it's C. So it's busy, but not that busy. Interesting thing about Santa Barbara is everything's west, right? Everything's out over the water. So if you're doing anything around, Santa Barbara, you're helping some research at UCSB or something like that. We have a lot of stuff there. Do you? It's a huge problem. Yeah, I was gonna say you're in control of the airspace. So I figured because you guys were kind of close, I figured there was some research up there. So um, yeah, anything in this circle, you need authorization. And the closer, the other thing too, the closer you are to the airport, the more <laughs> Basically, the more likely they they are to say no. Yeah, let's put it that way. And <laughs> UCSB is pretty close to the airport. But the closer you are to the airport, if you're further away, so if you're like out here, they'll be like, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah, you have our permission. Knock your stuff out. You're right here, so they're like, "Why? Why didn't you be there? Right? What are you gonna do? How long are you gonna be there? We don't want you there. Right? Just reject." This. Um, and that's probably the most. Di problematic spot for us because not only is it close but the runway is literally right right where we need to fly and this uh -huh. is where Goleta Beach is eroding so we get all these inquiries from the county like we want to know this tell us this but then the air tower you know it, it, it's it's complicated so so this is this is not not just legally but also just safety wise that because there are planes coming in and out and we need to be very careful right again ultimately it's because of safety Manned aircraft are less maneuverable than drones. And also, manned aircraft, the pilots don't know what we're doing. They don't know if we're actually doing research for some project, or if we're just like, look at how high I can go, kind of a thing, just zipping around. Look how close I can get to that airplane. You know, so they don't, they don't know. So they see drones and they start getting a little, little swirly and they get a little nervous and stuff. And they start telling the tower and right, it gets bad. So, so yeah, so again, it's justified. You can see you can see their argument of why they do this, but at the same token, it's frustrating because it's like, no, especially the city, the county, the state, they want us to do this. The towers, feds, they can be like, no, we just don't feel like it today. So usually they give a good reason. It's not just because we don't feel like it today, unless unless you're down in the John Wayne. But, uh, she just sometimes she'll just sometimes just be like, nah. Her big thing, her big tool, full disclosure, her big tool is just ignoring your request. So if you don't get a response back, it defaults to a no. Right? I don't have time for that. She just doesn't like drugs. <laughs> um, so, anyways, but right, but anything outside of here, right? The floor is 1500. So if you're doing stuff over here, you're doing stuff over here, floor is 1500. Okay? Anything outside of that, like you go up, there's the Santa Inez Airport, that gradient magenta thing around it, that's, that's class E. That's one of the class E identifiers. That's the lower class E identifier. That's class E with a floor 700. We're at 400, 700 still above us. So we're good to go unless we go to something that pushes us into 700, right? Makes sense, right? See the visual representation of it. So if you're flying around Lake Kachuma, you're good, right? You don't need, 
authorization your class G underneath that E shelf. This right here, this little dotted magenta line, you know, you're dotted, it's D, but that's magenta. So what is that? That's what I was talking about, that surface E. So surface E is basically the tower can use it to for overflow planes or send planes that way. It's not used all the time. So technically we don't, in this kind of scenario, we don't need authorization. But there is a, there's a gradient out here that makes it class E at 700. So as long as we're below 700, we don't need authorization even if we're right here. Now, some airports, Lake Tahoe is one, has surface E all around. So if it encompasses the, the airport and it's surface E, you need authorization. But there's not, not a whole lot of those. But like I said, Tahoe is one. Um, you guys, are you guys getting this? All right, kind of. We'll be doing some exercises. You guys, you guys will be doing this. Because like I said, arguably this is probably the hardest thing to wrap your head around for the 107. Right, because it's the newest kind of thing that's most foreign to us. All right. Um, but with this, when, pretty much once you get it, you can kind of get it. Right? And I would say, also on your 107 exam. So the 107 exam, I think I mentioned this before, 60 questions, the FAA has pretty much, well they say, but I don't, I haven't seen it, but they say they release all the questions. You can find all the questions in some capacity, not all together, but you find them all out there. But they've got like 400 questions that could be out of your 60. So everybody's 107 is slightly different. Right? Some have a little bit more weather, some have a little bit more aeronautical decision making, some have a little bit more airport operations. We'll get to all those later. But they all have a really good chunk of airspace classification in this stuff. Right? Because this is kind of like this is the definition of where we can fly and where we can't fly and how we can how what do we need to get. There's a couple things here that I want to show you. So further up at the top, where it's showing you that 111 right there, AGL, that gets into, that, that's military. That when you get into hash marks, that's when it starts getting like dicey. You have to pay attention. You can fly in a military operation area as long as it's not being used, as long as it's not active, right? You still need to, they'll have contact information and you will still need to reach out to the authoritative body, whatever that is, at that particular place. Just be like, hey, we're gonna be over there for a purpose, not be like, dude, I'm just gonna fly over there and check it out. You can't really do that. Um, I mean, you could, but Department of Defense, military can't shoot you down. So, um, and not fully. So, there it is, so there's no question about it. Um, so, so with that, like I said, you, those are things, uh, depending on the colors, like if it's, a, if it's a MOA, then that's a military operating area. You can go into a MOA um, and you can, op, you can fly and do stuff in the MOA, but it's good, you need to let the military know you're gonna be there. Um, there are some restricted areas. Right, straight up restricted. You can fly there if you get permission. For example, I, I do some work with the Shark Lab at Cal State Long Beach, doing beach mapping and stuff like that as far as with looking for human, where, where the humans go and where the sharks come in, right? I learned way too much about juvenile great white sharks. But <laughs> they were going down they have one researcher on their staff that is a 107. Actually, now I think they got two. I think they, they got someone that's a 107. So that's why we were helping them out. But they were doing stuff down in San Diego. They were doing some research around Coronado. All right? You guys are familiar with Coronado. 
that's where Navy SEAL training is. And so, and San Diego's got some crazy, crazy airspace down there because of the Navy base and because of all that. So, um, and the SEAL training. So they were like, we want to go down there, but it's really crazy. So I was helping them reach out. I said, you can do it. You just need to talk to them. Let them know what you're doing. You tell them it's for marine biological research about sharks. They know you're not an international spy, then you're good. So, and they get they're like, yeah, we got it. We got authorization. Like, I told you, you're good. So it's not impossible. It's just a lot of communication and planning ahead of time, right? You identify it and like, okay, I need to operate there. We're gonna have some work, like, like with Santa Barbara. Like you try to, you know, pack a lunch, plan a trip. We gotta go down there and talk and get requests and right. So, but like I said, these things identify where you can and can't fly. Right. There's also. Wait, hold on. Gonna use a laser pointer. Um, <laughs> but up there at the top where it's got like that those little right above the 100 there where it says IR 425 with an arrow that way and then it says IR 200 with an arrow this way those are military training rounds so I think this is Vandenberg Air Force Base I think um, so like an edge and what that happens is they they have basically fast moving jets or oh thanks that works so you guys see right there so these are the lines. And so what, what it's saying is there's some fast moving military aircraft in there. That's their training round. And it's not like in that just specific line, but it's you know like within that range because they're not exactly specific. So what'll happen is it'll say like IR and it'll say it'll have either three digit number or four digit number. Three digit number, we don't have to worry about too high, like 1,200 feet, right? We're 400, we're fine. If there's a four digit number, then they can almost be surface. So that's low military aircraft coming in. We can fly there at our own peril, right? So um, just because it's not all the time, it's just maybe this week they're doing maneuvers, or this week they're doing something, but they're not doing anything for the next month. So it's if we're out there and we start to hear jets, yeah, it's time to just land, right? If, especially if it's a four-digit number. See where they're coming through. Well, let me let me tell you. So my my sister and brother-in-law used to have a house out in Twenty Nine Palms, and which is. It's just that's just God's country. Out there. There's nothing out in Twenty Nine Palms, but it's not your Joshua Tree National Monument and stuff like that. We used to go out there because we stay there and then go out to the Joshua Tree. But um, there's a massive Marine base out there, right? And where their house was, we used to ride horses, and there's a ridge just behind the house, and the ridge opens up into this really big kind of valley area, and that's where the Marines used to do a lot of their training and stuff. They come out there and do maneuvers, and there was a live fire range not too far from there. So we'd sit out there and just watch. Um, it's kind of cool. But this was pre drone. But now, looking at it as I have, the drone, you could, if they're not there, you could fly out there. Obviously, you need their permission. But if they're there, no, right? Don't, don't be that guy. Don't be like, oh, I want to check it out. Because again, they will shoot you down. And not even, not even, nobody would question it. So that's the, that's the thing. They can legally do that. So, um, but yeah, when you see those, that's military training rounds. Also, again, a telltale sign that you're near a military base. Just be polite, talk to your neighbors, let them know what you're doing. Right? Um, Right, so that, you guys kind of get that? You guys kind of get an understanding like airspace? Okay, 
let's take a trip to Michigan. So, <laughs> Detroit Metro. I did this one because I saw it and I was like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> I was like, what is this? There's Detroit Metro right there. What airspace classification is Detroit Metro? It doesn't say on there, so yeah. What's that? Probably. Yeah, yeah, it is. Just because, from what I was throwing out there, you see if you guys are listening, it's the blue. Magenta C, blue Bravo. Right? So, this is that wedding cake. But it's really an ugly looking wedding cake because it's it's only one sided. Over here it's not. So but I, I like this one because there's different layers, right? There's the layers of the different wedding cakes, right? So everything is ten thousand foot ceiling, but the floor is four thousand, the floor is thirty five hundred, floor is three thousand, right? Floor is twenty five hundred, floor is service. Right here, we're paying attention to us here. I'm like, oh, good, good go, good go. I can fly out here because it's 2,500 is the floor. If you come this way, and you're like, oh, there's the class C, or class B right here, but I'm gonna fly, I'm flying over here. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm out of you, class B, because this one's 3,500. Ha <laughs> screw you, class B. Uh -uh. This dotted line, represents class D, because this airport, this Belleville airport, right? So, like I said, don't, when you're looking at sectional charts, don't jump to conclusions like, oh, oh that's it. Always look deeper, always look to see, like, let me just make sure what's touching my world. If anything encompasses it, right? So just because you're out of this and underneath this shelf, there's something else there. And it's, that's, that's that deep. So now, instead of going to this tower, you need to go to this tower to get permission. And the, this D ceiling, there's a funky thing about it. So this, here's a D right here, right? With Ann Arbor. So, and this, you look, when you see the dotted lines for D, you immediately look for that little bracket. You see the number in the bracket. 33, 3300. So it's, Surface to 3,300, right? This one, look for the dotted line. See the airport, there's the bracket. Negative 30, is that below ground? No, that is up to, but not including 3,000. So it's 2,999. They just didn't want to have to put all that stuff in. So there's, there's up to, but not including 3,000. Why? Because Detroit Metro Class D super or Class B supersedes it and takes over from three thousand up. Right, so B is greater than D, therefore they take the priority. They take that three thousand marker, and this one's up to but not included. Okay. So um, there's something else on here. Oh. I, have to, I haven't checked this out. I, I want to check this out. Does anybody know? Is anybody familiar with the Detroit area at all? There's, so one thing, you got the international border over here. But two, what the hell are these? So you have structures over there. And when you look at structures, right, these are structures. And these little upside down Bs right here, there are the Ms, right? These are, these are like mountains or peaks, right? These are structures like towers, radio towers, and stuff like that. Wind turbines, I, I don't know, I pulled out the Palm Springs one, but if you ever go out to Palm Springs, you see those big wind turbines and stuff like that. They're indicated on the sectional charts. Um, but these peaks, so now with these peaks, there's two numbers. There's 1124, and then there's 500 in the parentheses. 1124 is a cute number. We don't have to pay attention to it. We only pay attention to what's in the parentheses. That's just, you'll never be asked about the 1124. You'll be asked about that. 500 is AGL. That's how high that peak is, AGL. So, if you're flying a drone, and over here, 400 plus 500, 900 feet. 
you're going to 900 feet AGL. Therefore, you need to see, is, is there any airspace classification that pushes me up into, you know, like what, what do I hit if I'm in 900, right? 500, it's, so it's whatever it is plus 400. There is, right here, there's a 426. So 426 plus 400, that's 826. Right? So then I'm looking around like, what is 826? Because there is that class E that's at 700. So maybe if I see that, that gradient, maybe it might do it. But it looks like I'm okay, even if I go to the peak. Right? The reason why I ask about these towers. So these towers are structures, structures, not necessarily towers. 1060. 1064, 1053. What the hell do we have up at the border, on the edge of the Canadian border with like that's that's thousand feet high? I mean, what's cool is we can go 400 feet above that, so we can go 1455, right? But I'm just curious as to what what is what is this? What is that? So I have to I keep telling myself every time I show the slide, I'm like I gotta check that. Um, there's there's some of these little towers will have little Lightning bolts coming off the top of it. Those are beacon. Those are ones like I don't know if you if you're driving at night. Sometimes it's the electrical tower and it's got a little red light that flashes. That's letting manned aircraft know there's something here. Don't hit it, right? So what this is indicating there's a beacon up there. Remember these charts were made for pilots, manned aircraft pilots, airplane pilots, helicopter pilots. So this. We're conforming to that. So some of this stuff is there. I mean, again, do we need to know if there's a beacon or not? Nah, but it, you know, thanks, you know. Um, I just know I can go 1487 over top of that. So it's 400 feet up, it's 400 feet around the structure. So you don't have to immediately drop down. You have, you have the ability to kind of go around it, right? So because manned aircraft has to stay 500 feet above, so 500 feet above, right? So it gives us that cushion. So yeah, like I said, the biggest thing when you see these things, don't, don't hyperventilate. Because you're like, oh, oh, oh my God. Um, this, like this dial right here, the circle is a dial that's really prominent. And it was like, oh, what is that? Not us. Don't worry about it. That's instrumentation. That's not us. Don't, don't blow your brain down with that because you don't need it. So just look at what pertains to us. The FAA just wants us to just look at what pertains to us. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So all that magenta you can fly in. The magenta, the belt line, within that, like just along the magenta line. Is These right here? The shaded, yeah. So what this is, and I clipped the, the, the photo, I, I made it a little tighter. And usually what happens, the, this magenta gradient is it's class E, right? And it's the lower class E. There's a, there's a blue gradient that's a higher class E, which you don't have to really worry about. And it's like 12, it's like 12 or 1800. Um, but the magenta class, the magenta gradient is 700 foot floor, right? For class E. Like I said before, you can think of Class C is like the cream filling that's squished in between. So basically what happens is this class E kind of encompasses the whole thing. So if it's not B, or if it's not, like the B here, so you have these layers of the cake, the shelves, Under, right underneath it, you hit E, down to 700 feet. But where can we fly? 400 feet. We don't touch it unless you're going over the peaks or structures or something like that, right? That's where you have to pay attention to. So if you hit a structure, like go over this thing, it's 410. I'm going to go 400. That's going to push me into 810. I see this circle. I'm going to go into Class E. But if I'm just flying around a neighborhood doing real estate photography or something like that, I'm not going to go up into 700 feet. Therefore, it's basically like it's it's B with E with G, right? G under E under B, right? If that makes sense? 
think in layers. Like I said, that's the thing you got to think of. That's a good, good observation. Is what is it? What is it where I'm flying? And and you have to drill down and kind of pull these layers back. Well, it's not B. What else is there? Oh, underneath the B, it looks like there's an E. Okay, but that's E to 700. What's underneath that? Nothing. G. Right? You get? Make sense? Yeah, when you look at the whole thing, it'll it'll these layers will branch out. I was just looking at mostly like I wanted to get the surface part in here, but they will connect because they all close off. Okay. They're all they're all closed off. So, did you have another one? Yeah, um, I noticed that there's like radio. Do you guys ever like use radio like the VHS to just kind of scan while you're doing your research? That's what's around. Well, do you guys do you guys use radio, Sean? We have them, yeah. I mean, we, don't, we, we don't, on our default thing, we don't need them, but we have them for when we go near airports and stuff. Yeah. By FAA regulations, you're supposed to monitor the, the tower. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right here, the control tower frequency, again, we'll get into this later on. Don't like, don't like, I gotta write this down right now. But right here, it'll say the control tower frequency is 118.4. So on your radio, 118.4. You already got authorization in class B, fly in here. They say, are you monitoring a control tower? Yes, I am. Here it is. Right? Again, they're just like, blah, 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 blah. You know. One thing I'll say, another one that we have that I, I would strongly recommend you guys do, it's not required to graduate or anything like that, but um, very helpful. Um, in addition to our Wilderness First Day, the one unit class you can take, field professionalism, we just do over one or two weekends kind of thing. Uh, I think this semester we're doing it out on Santa Rosa Island, I think, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, but also Ben Quo, the instructor for that class, also teaches um, a, um, a emergency communication class. So you go over ham, so you can get your ham, you, you don't have to get it, but you basically can, can get your ham radio <coughs> license. But in that class, again, it's just a it's like a one unit thing, and it's just uh, it's not this semester. We'll offer it probably next semester. But it's a really great one. So we go over basic communication. So cell phone. Uh, ham radio, uh, all these kinds of stuff, uh, and and they, um, it's very helpful to know that, and it's a great thing on your resume to pop in there that hey, I'm familiar with you know, using uh, radio communications in, in just communication senses and in emergency uh, settings. So yeah, and yeah. especially if you can get your, I think the first level is technician, yeah. like your yeah. te your technician. I, I it's on my list of things to do. Um, I know a couple of guys are into IT. If you were doing it, especially if you're going to start messing, around, I almost said a bad word, you're messing around with drones. Um, it's came out of the <laughs> but if you start messing around with drones and you know adjusting and adding kind of things, then um, uh, the FAA wants you to be certified by the FCC to have that radio operator license from the ARC connection. So those of you guys that are getting into IT, they're like another test, right? Um, but you get that certification. The thing is, you get that certification, then you're good. You just, I mean. It's super easy to do that with us, right? Like this class and other things, once you guys graduate, it, you can still do it, but it, it becomes uh, yeah more tricky, more expensive, that kind of stuff. Right, right. So yeah, because they just want you, since you're now you're dealing with radio frequencies and radio communications, they want you to be able to be licensed or certified to actually operate it. There's, and there's three layers for radio, ham radio operator, license, and you don't have to, connect, you just need the first level really just to kind of acknowledge like, yeah, I understand how radio frequencies work and I'm able to operate on this low band, right? Um, but great, that's great, especially if it's like a one unit class, yeah, take it. Because um, again, another thing. Oh, right here, these, I know you probably can't see it, but this shows you, like, these are little wind turbines, like, would be out in Palm Springs. Okay, so you guys are like, great, we're in Detroit, great, great. Let's get local. So, this is, this is us, right where we are, right? So, we have the Point Magoo, right? Again, hash marks, military, right? If you're gonna go out there, you're gonna run into, you know, they're 
hey, you know, <laughs> hey, we're gonna fly drones, kind of a thing. So, um, you run into, oh yeah, you do have Surface. It's a Surface E. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was talking about the Tahoe. This magenta, right? It goes around, right? Right. So that means you need authorization. It's Surface E, which means it's not super busy, but it's busy enough that you gotta get authorization from the tower. And it's just, it's just, you gotta think about that in terms of it's not like, oh, they're keeping track of us. It's just almost common courtesy. Because that way they can alert their pilots, hey, there's drone activity in this area. Don't, don't yell at us about drones, right? Because I talked to pilots in Fullerton and they said, yeah, anytime we see drones, we just call the town and be like, there's drones over there. You know? If they didn't get alerted to it, you know, because they just, because they don't know what you're going to do. So, um, so yeah, so you, there's surface E and then there's 700 foot E, this magenta gradient, right? And then you have the dotted line here, right? So, which is D and the dotted line bumps into Oxnard here with this, right? So... We have Oxnard, Camarillo, um, Point Magoo, all right here, right? And then you were talking about Santa Paula. Who's talking about Santa Paula? Yeah, yeah Santa Paula is right here. So Santa Paula is way out here, not towered, no classification. Don't hit anybody, right? So um, they have hang gliders out there. Or actually glider sailplanes out there. So just be on the lookout for those. But there's no there's nothing encircling encompassing Santa Paula, right? So and it's outside of the uh, Camarillo class E airspace, so you're good to go. Right? Just don't hit anything. So, um but here you know, depending on where you go, a lot of it, unless you're in the surface E, a lot of it you're underneath, unless you hit, or these Ds, right? Oxnard, we can wear Oxnard. Oh, Oxnard Camarillo, there it is. Oxnard Camarillo, Point Magoo. Everybody's class D. So you got this big conjoined bubble. So surface to 3,000, surface to 2,000, surface to 2,000. So if you're flying anywhere around here, right here, you're in controlled airspace and need authorization from the tower. That sounds scary. That sounds like, oh my gosh, I need authorization for the tower. It's like it's like a top secret kind of clearance or anything like that. It's it's not. Are they you are they all Lance up here? Oh the, uh, yeah. Can you, okay. Fullerton yeah. it's like last year was that one. Like it, they just got one. I'm so excited. Um, so it's automate. Like you can automate, you can. Oh, but we we historically always call. You call. Yeah. But I'm letting you know, sometimes you can just automate the request. Right. So it's not I'm letting you know it's not like it's a big, top secret imposing kind of a thing. Um, you can call the tower. You can do a formal. You can do the online one if they don't have um, the lands or they don't have the, the tower connection. And I do that before, and we said that before with the tower. They don't want a lot of people calling, but they want some people calling. Um, or you can do the automated one. Okay. So, so it's okay. Like I said, don't think of like, oh my gosh, you know, it, it, it's not an overwhelming or big deal to get request get permission from or request permission from the tower. They can reject it, but it's not a big deal to request it. Right. So. Um, the weird thing though, it's interesting. It's not indicated on the sectional chart, but it's indicated on the apps with Malibu and the state parks and stuff with restrict there's you can't you can't fly in national parks. You can fly in many state parks, but not all state parks. You have to check with the state park. Um, the it's it's just like the 
restricted airspace. You can't fly, but you need you need permission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can fly. Well, except not national park. I mean, national no, park, park too. But you just you, you have to have it. There's an the application process. Has to, to kind of give their nod on that one. Otherwise, just imagine if you guys go up to Yosemite and half of them would just be like covered with drones and people flying. Around, right? If you guys been up to Yosemite and you, you come in that where you come in that curve right out of the tunnel. And there's that part on the side of the road where everybody's like standing on top of each other's shoulders to take pictures of half time and hill cap. Just imagine if they allowed drones. If people were acting that crazy, now they're gonna put drones in it, it would it would just it would it would be ugly, right? So there's a reason why, because there's a lot of times where it's like, oh man, I wish I could fly in a national park. But at the same time, you're taking all that beauty, you're like, you know what? I'm okay with that, right? So, but you can, right? Department of Interior has a lot of drones and stuff, and if you're doing research in collaboration with them, they'll work with you on it and get that operation. You know. So, I mean, it's nothing's ever a permanent no. It's just you have, there's just some negotiating and purpose. You have to do it with a purpose. Right? Um, but yeah, so there is different situation. Like I said, usually here, I'll, I'll tell you about the apps in a second, but usually on the app, it'll identify the airspace and Malibu is just, but it's not, it's not possible. It's just, they're trying to get rid of all the looky loops, right? All the paparazzi. Stuff. Um, Unless they want to fly their helicopters, then they can do it. Then they can do it, yeah. yeah. But not, not drones. Not the common people. <laughs> so, um, right here, this is another, just another thing. This is a Surface E. So there's Surface E. When Surface E is connected, then it's a thing. But if Surface E is a bump out, then we're okay. Again, that's overflow. It's still, it's in a, it's surface E, but it's really like class G for us. Like we don't have, we don't need authorization. But it would be G. You still look at this, this 700, so you can't go above 700. Okay. So it's just layers and layers and layers. I was looking for, I was going to try to get Santa Rosa. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. There's there. an airstrip out there. Yeah. Is there? Okay, yeah. Because Santa Kappa, you can't, and then. Um, yeah, it looks the same. Oh, is it really? It, yeah. Okay. So they, they've just, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, same, National Park. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, bring it down, because I want to show you a, a unique situation. So this is John Wayne Santa Ana, down where I'm at. So here it is. There's a unique thing that, uh, by the way, beaches for the most part, are pretty clear. Beaches are usually oftentimes class G or G under something. We have a thing down here like in Newport Beach, right? So Newport Beach, there's a there's a Newport Beach, there's a bay, there's a harbor, I should say, harbor, and then there's the beach, there's this peninsula that goes here. The the, the surface magenta line goes right down the peninsula. Beach side we can fly all day long. Harbor side, we got to get authorization. So weird. Like I can walk across, and I, I, I need authorization. I can fly. It's weird. So anyway, just a unique thing that we have. Right the other unique thing that we have down there is with this is a thing that, that the FAA can do. The FAA at any time um, can put what's called a TFR, right, which is a temporary flight restriction. And at that moment, usually it's for a good reason, right? Air Force One, Air Force Two, the president, the vice president are in an area. Whenever they're in a location, TFR, right? While they're at that location. TFR means it's a flight restriction, nobody can fly. I mean, you can fly, just like you have to ask permission and stuff like that, but now, now you're not just asking the FAA, you're asking the Secret Service. And you have to have a justification of why you're doing it. Right? I've had, I know some guys that uh, are drone pilots uh, for, they do a lot of real estate, a lot of photo business and stuff in South Florida. And when Trump was president and down in Mar-a-Lago, they would just be like, you know, they could still work, but they had to, they had another contact with these so, uh, Secret Service that then get permission from Secret Service. And then the Secret Service had to clear with FAA and then you and then if you're DJI, then it's all locked, and you have to go to DJI and get it unlocked. Um, but 
but that happens like if there's uh, the wildfires and stuff up in Northern California right now, TFR, FAA puts a TFR over that because they don't want drone pilots inter interceding with, um, fire. yeah, fire, fire retardant and airplanes. They do and they, they have to land everything, but technically that's a TFR, right? What about like sporting events? Before? That's what I was just going to get to. The next one is outdoor sporting events, professional and like division one sports, automatic TFR. It's not impossible, but you have to have you have to have a reason for it, like a, a, a Goodyear blimp and stuff like that. You know, if you're flying around, or, you know, they have a reason also they're kind of higher. But um, it's not impossible, but they put the TFR on there because they don't want a lot of drones flying around. Right? So they can put TFRs up. Police can put TFRs up uh, when Kobe Bryant crashed. When the helicopter crashed, TF, uh, LA County Sheriff's put a TFR up over that to not get rid of the looky loos and people messing things up and a bunch of drones taking pictures and that kind of stuff. So they put TFR. So, so TFRs, temporary flight restrictions, while that activity is going on, it's restricted. While the dignitary or the special VIP person is in the location, TFR. Once they leave, once that activity ends, TFR goes away. We get notified. Um, there's another acronym called a NOTAM. It's notice to airmen that you're supposed to pay attention to and look at before you fly in the areas to see if there's NOTAMs. Um, and it will tell you if there's a TFR. Plus, I'll show you in a second, the apps will indicate that there's a TFR and they'll let you know what's going on. Um, so, but it's up to us to um, to identify those, right, and, and be aware of those. We can't fly those. So, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> so, down in Orange County, there's this little circle right here, right, <laughs> with this right there. Yeah. So, Disney has what's called a permanent temporary flight restriction. So Disney put this through shortly after September 11th and went through Senator Feinstein, had it on the bill, went through and got approved through Congress. So there is basically 3,000 feet, three nautical miles around Disneyland. I have students down there training and they live in Anaheim. So uh, I'm just saying you're just not flying. I mean, you can, you can get permission, but now there's a, there, Disney has a person. So you contact Disney for Disney's approval to then approve for the FAA to then clear. Or, or you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another factor way to get around that, but yeah. for all uh, Disney I, special. Uh, yeah. Just Disney. Disney. Disney put that in. It, and slid that through and got it. Is there also one in Disney World? I'm pretty sure it's mm -hmm. Disney World too. Yeah, they've got their own pilots. Yeah. yeah. You gotta, yeah. That's a huge, like, but that, you, that's a lot of land. They're on stuff for you. Like, yeah. I mean, it's not like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the closer you are to the park, no. But this encompasses down there with us, that encompasses Angel Stadium. Again, most, if not nearly all of the city of Anaheim. Um, it's crazy. It's it's crazy. So it's frustrating. The back door is so, and a buddy that had to um, was hired to do a, uh, shoot some video at the Anaheim Convention Center. Anaheim Convention Center is right across the street from Disney, right? Um, they the guys who were putting on the trade show wanted the drone to fly up and down before people got in. They just wanted to kind of capture what the trade show layout looks like and get some aero shots of it. It's at the Disney TFR, just right across. So, but it's inside. So you're like, well, I'm inside. I should be able to go. That's fine. They get a DJI aircraft. DJI has, one of the major drawbacks to DJI is what's called um, geofencing. And it was part of what DJI kind of did to make nice with the FAA, where 
through GPS, it identifies where you are and identifies the classification. If you are in controlled airspace, you need to unlock, you need to go through a DJI system to unlock it because they don't want you flying, hey, look, FAA, we're locking your drones down to keep your, keep your airspace safe. Don't you like us? You know, we're not really spying on you. Um, <laughs> so, um, so there's an added step with DJI drones where you have to go through like a custom unlock. We can go through the website and put your authorization in. You put your, your serial number from your radio con your controller in there. And you acknowledge that you're taking responsibility and you do have, you know, you say you have authorization, blah, 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 and it's not them. And then they put through the, you know, they zap your drone to where it unlocks it. And then even on the drone, you get like a checkoff list that you have to like, yep, Yep, I know I'm flying in control airspace. Yep, I'm taking full responsibility. Yep, I know you told me. And then, then it unlocks. Pain in the ass, right? The way around that, don't fly DJI. You know, yep. <laughs> fly something other than DJI. And what he did is he ended up, they got a unique drone and that doesn't have geofencing. So he was able, it was a bigger, a little bit of a bigger drone than what he was planning on. But he was able to go and do it without having to be unlocked. Because he's already inside. So it, when you're inside a structure, I guess I should specify that. When you're inside a structure, you're not in the national airspace. You're in the structure's building, right? So therefore, airspace classification doesn't apply to you inside of a building, right? Inside a structure. Even if uh, the FAA was trying to say for a long time they controlled all airspace, even in buildings, but that that has not worked. The other thing with TFR is that the it, there's lots of issues with TFRs, um, but uh, we're talking about these things that are more understandable, like yeah. uh, you know, security situation for a, an individual right. or a, or a large public event. Um, where we have the most issues with them is because we do a lot of stuff with disasters, so oil spills, wildfires, things like that, and. In, in situations that are, are like that, um, it, it's uh, because there could be air, manned aircraft in the end, and, and unmanned these days, but, um, but uh, uh, the agency will put in a temporary flight restriction over the area for you know, understandable reasons, but there will be an air boss who's the, who's the local person, maybe they're a uh, National Guard, maybe you know, it's gonna depend on the situation, but, but but they're the ones that's in charge of like the firefighting aircraft or, or that kind of deal. And what we found is many times they don't want anything to, to be involved with uh, their operations. Totally makes sense while they're firefighting or doing the emergency response. But in the case of uh, the refugio oil spill, I argue very clearly that made us, that, that had a huge environmental impact. So if we'd been able to put up our drones as we tried, we could have seen this sheen that was developing. Initially, it looked like it was blowing offshore. Everybody said, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. And then over the course of the next 60 days, it came ashore all around Southern California with weeks and weeks and weeks of investigation and people were fighting whether what it was coming from, was this an oil spill, whatever. And, and, and all because we couldn't get up and, and see the situation quickly. Secondly, um, wildfires are a very common one. So in the case of Thomas Fire, for example, they threw up a, a temporary flight restriction, right, which makes sense. And then we start, we start getting calls to go help some of these communities look at, map their hillsides so they can understand if they're in danger of a uh, mud event, a mudslide event. The TFR stayed in place for two and a half months. There's no reason, right? I mean, I mean, you know, the first the week or two or whatever is one thing, but, but, um, Certain agencies just see drones as bad, 100% bad, no good, no good. And even when you make requests for flying, you're like, no, 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 no. And so, and you, there's no recourse, right? Is there, there's, there's this individual that, that's the local one in charge, and he or she is just, you know, in charge, which, you know, I guess makes sense in an organizational standpoint. But, but it, it is frustrating for those of us that are trying to respond. And one of the most interesting ones that I haven't had time to run down, but just in the last couple of weeks, I think it was the Caldor fire or, or one of them, one of them that, that started that, that's burning now uh, in Northern California. Um, the fire just started and um, apparently someone put up a drone to look and see what was going on and they grounded all the aircraft. 
and so they said, uh, hey, this, this uh, uh, you know, person or whatever uh, uh, caused the fire to be, you know, we, we, we didn't contain it, and now it's out of control. Then that report came out in the article that I first read. It said the, fi the fire was one acre in extent. It's very unusual for someone to throw a TFR when a, when a fire has just started. So we also have a history, unfortunately, in, in our state with CAL FIRE, has sort of had a political issue with drones. And they've they very much used this as a wedge to get the law passed, which now says it's illegal to fly, right, if you fly a drone and you interfere with firefighting aircraft. But it's also why you'll see them ground the aircraft, like instantly. Oh, everything's grounded. And, and again, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't be safe and, and they need to be safe, but there's very often a show of this to sort of provide a signal to the public that you shouldn't be flying in and around these areas even when several instances I know, there are folks that were reporters that, that were trying to get you know, footage for news or whatever, and they checked with the authorities and they said, hey, is it okay to do this? I don't want to cause any interference. And uh, this was before the laws went into effect. And they said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And then they get persecuted. So, or prosecuted, I should say. So anyway, so the point is um, the TFRs are very real. We should, we should pay attention to them, but, but they do cause an extra layer of complication for us, they're meant for the general public, but as an incidental, we, we sometimes get caught up in some of the, no, you can't ever do this ever type stuff. Right. That, you know, the biggest thing I told you last week is, you know, kind of now that you guys are venturing the drones to, you guys are all deputized as advocates for safe flying and doing it for research purposes, doing it for commercial purposes, doing it for the best interest, and you're not one of these guys, who can all I can fly kind of a thing, right? Because what happens is those people that do that make it harder because the air boss or whoever, Cal Fire, has that impression of that's their version of a drone. And so you come in there and say, hey, we want to do this because we want to map it, and we're going to bring a drone that, nope, nope, TFR. You know, and they'll slap a TFR down quick, you know. Um, once they identify something, they'll, you know, they think like, oh, this has the potential to have looky loo aircraft or potentially have public interest, TFR. So it, it, they're a pain, um, and it's frustrating. Um, so, but, so yeah, they, 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 they are, and it doesn't, by the thing, by the, I should say, it's not even, you can't be like, well, I just won't fly DJI. It's not a DJI, it's not a manufacturer thing, it's, it's, it's a flight thing. And the ironic thing about fire is LA County Fire, has probably one of the largest drone fleets yep. in the state. Yep. But yet, DFR, you know, you guys can't fly. It's like, what are you? Hmm. So in my experience, uh, <laughs> with, with what, what happens with the firefighter folks is, uh, I have many firefighter friends, but they um, like, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, we don't want to use that technology. We, and then a firefighter retires, <laughs> starts a business, he goes, hey, what about we use this technology? Like, yeah, that's cool. And then they'll give it to that person, usually a, an old dude. And then, and then, uh, and then they start using the technology. But <laughs> but it's it's they're like farmers in that way. It's it's hard to get them to get on board. But once one of their colleagues gets on board, then it's easy to get the the management action or the decision thing adopted. There is, as you said, I, I think I was talking about. There's a huge company now, organization, I should say, that was started by retired fire firefighters. And that, you know, promote public safety and drones and public safety and blah, 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 blah. And everybody's like rallying around it. Before they were like, oh, yeah, no, no. But now this one of us went over there. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like, but it's the same thing we've been talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, but you just wave around that, oh, no, public safety, talking to public safety. You know, anyways, um, it's because I'm going actually to a drone conference. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday next week. So I'll be back in time for class. So it doesn't, doesn't affect this one. But, um, and, and that organization and the organization, like, they're, they're really, like, right now, public safety is the bell of the ball right now in, in, the, in drone industry. Like, they're pushing out, like, oh, public safety, public safety. But it's like, but you guys are also the ones yep. that do that. So it's like, hmm. um, So, yes. So, you need to be aware when you fly, you check notice to airmen, you check the NOTAMs, your app, you can, I'll show you an app, which apps to look at. 
get apps that will identify it, and you can go through that way. So it makes it a little bit easier. You should follow up with, you know, again, if you're planning a research trip or planning a, a longer kind of a thing, do your due diligence and look on the websites and look for notes and that kind of stuff. But um, but again, you can also get backups as come with changes on the fly. It'll pop up on your app. But um, there are instances that there are <laughs> there are permanent temporary flight restrictions, whatever they want. Um, again, coming from the south, um, I like the Channel Islands a lot, but down there we go to Catalina, and so I just wanted to show you guys Catalina um, because I didn't I didn't grab Santa Rosa or anything like that. But up in this area, you have national parks, you have naval testing, you have a lot of protected areas that you can't really fly around. You, you guys can come down to Catalina and fly <laughs> So, right? Chase Buffalo, whatever you want to do, right? So, you guys know Catalina has buffalo. There's just wild buffalo out there. I used to go, I used to camp out there a lot, and it's just crazy. Buffalo, boars, and stuff, and you just cruise around golf carts. It's great. Anyways, um, so yeah, come on down. It's just this class E, so you can't go over 700, but there's nothing on Catalina that'll push you up over to 700. So, you're fine. All right. The, I kept referring to apps. So these are some apps, they're free, and you should download them. You should download them. It's okay if you have Wi-Fi right now, you can download them. <laughs> <laughs> trying to tell you you can. So, I didn't get the logo for Before You Fly, but there's AirMap, and there's a lot, some people have issues with air map, um, but they kind of do the same thing. A lot used to be called Kitty Hawk, but now it's called Loft. Um, a, they actually have a lot more data, a lot more information, because uh, they'll have weather and information right from the right on the home screen. You can plan your flights from there, plan out your missions. You can request. Um, Authorization, that's why I was asking about Lance, which is local area airspace authorization. I forgot what it's for, but um, basically, if you see that you are in a particular controlled airspace and it will tell you, oh, you're in Camarillo Class D and it, it, you, know, you need authorization, you can then type your stuff, put your information in there. How high are you going to go? How long are you going to be? When are you going to fly from? Where? Why are you out there? What's your phone number? Kind of a thing. And then you submit it. And they can get back to you. Okay. Um, so it's kind of nice. thing I didn't show you on this, when you look at, and I didn't want to go too deep because it's not on the 107, but what will happen is in, air, in the airspace, the controlled airspace map, there's a grid system. And in the grid system, Usually it's like zeros and fifties, one hundreds and two hundreds. Um, the closer you are to an airport, it says zero. Further out, it goes up incrementally. Um, what that is, is that is your, and you can get the grids off of these guys. You can see, you can zoom in and see the grids. And it shows you where exactly you are and shows you what grid you're in. It'll be like 50 or 100. Basically, if you are asking if you are requesting through Lance and if it says 100 and you're like oh cool I only want to go up to 100 feet so you put that in automatic you'll get automatic authorization it'll just ping you right back you put it in it comes right back it's the same up to that you are you are able to fly with automatic authorization if you're going to go over it like oh I'm in a hundred grid there but uh but we need to go to 250 you got to put the authorization and then you got to wait for the tower. It'll email the tower and then the tower will then respond back to you. But it's on their schedule. The guys at Fuller, the Fullerton Tower, they say they, they check they check airspace requests um, twice a day. That's the one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And if you don't hit that window, then you got to wait for the next go, you know, kind of a thing. So um, that's why it's a good call. So if you have that relationship. But. Um, but if you're in a new area, you can do that. If you need to go up kind of quick or immediate or one of those things, you'll see on the grid, right? But like I said, if it's above that, it won't be automatic. Um, it'll, it'll be up to that tower. So 
again, further away from the airport you are, the easier it is to get clearance and authorization applied. Closer, it's going to take it's going to take some time. So don't. The other thing too, don't request authorization to fly from the field. Just a word of advice. So you're out there. Oh crap! I forgot to ask for authorization because then you're going to be waiting and you know and waiting, waiting, waiting. If you know you're going to be doing some research, you know you're going to go out the field. You know, plan ahead, request ahead, and get that all taken care of, or do it before you go out to the field or whatever. Just do it ahead of time because then it makes it easier. Right? Um, this before you fly, I didn't put the logo up, but before you fly is the app that the FAA puts out. So you can't do, they're not, you can't do the Lance request, which is the authorization request from before you fly, but before you fly, I used to hate their app, um, but they hired these guys to redo it, so now their app is kind of cool. Um, it's kind of similar, but it, so any of those apps are all free. Uh, and you, so like I'll, I like AirMap just because it's real easy, right? A lot has a lot of information. So if I'm just doing the, if I'm just flying or I'm just driving through the neighborhood or whatever, I did that today. As a matter of fact, I was up, where was I? It was somewhere, I, I might have been just south of Thousand Oaks. So anyway, I was down there. I'm like, what airspace am I in right now? So I'm driving. I'm like, you know, if I wanted to fly here, just pop up a drone. Where would I? What you know? Where would I? So, because it's real quick, it'll show you, right? So, um, so again, these are and they're free. So, use these apps. So the other thing too is with these, is they will um, that all this stuff. Let me go back to the craziness. All this stuff is is in the app and in a very user-friendly way. So from a practical flying standpoint, day-to-day -day use, fly, using drones, I'm using the apps. From the part 107 exam, I'm reading this, right? We need to interpret this in order to understand what that does, right? That makes sense? Yeah, okay. All right, any questions? Okay, let me go ahead and that off, because just in time my battery's going to die. Okay.